Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Ozcast. It can be lonely at the top. We all know what it's like to lead and own a business and wanting to scale, but finding yourself at a glass ceiling. That is where the power of collaboration and connection comes in. Hi, I'm Natasha Milani. I'm an expert at helping businesses and business owners harness the power of collaboration to connect, scale and grow. I am passionate about collaboration. I believe that no one executes alone. We all do better when we do it together. Welcome to this Power of Collaboration podcast. It's wonderful to have you here. I hope you get the inspiration and information you need to harness the power of collaboration to break through your glass ceiling. Today, we are talking to Louise Rowe. Louise is formerly of Energy Exemplar and now invests in property development and growing South Australian businesses. Welcome, Louise. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks for having me. Louise, I I know your story and it's one of great success. I'll just start by asking you, where do you hail from? Tell us about Louise. I'm formerly from Adelaide, you know, a working class family, public school education and did an apprenticeship in carpentry and a bit of bibs and bobs from there, worked in pubs, security and then in 1999 formed Drayton Analytics which formed into Energy Exemplar which is a power market simulation software company that ended up being a global software company in the power market industry. From hospitality and security to founding uh, an energy technology business, can you share with the audience about that journey? Yes, I was a security guard on the privatisation of ETSA where I was studying to do a private investigating Cert 3 to run my own private investigating company where I met my future husband, Glenn, who was a consultant on the sale and was over here from New Zealand. We ended up getting together and couldn't decide what business was going to take off. He was a consultant working for a consulting company in New Zealand. I wanted to live in Adelaide, so we relocated back here to Adelaide and set up a company called Drayton Analytics where Glenn rewrote a software that he had done his PhD in and I established the company and we got the South Australian government as our first client. And from then, we ended up just running Drayton Analytics, which then turned into Energy Exemplar, as a consulting company, which afforded us to be able to write the software, to be able to get it to market. Paths crossed, sparks flew, (laughs) and uh, here we are today with a uh, large technology company success story and you've gone on to help many others. Yes, Glenn wrote the software but also um, we had a consulting arm which obviously someone had to run the company and run the accounts and run the legals and so therefore we were a, a good team together. He obviously didn't have any idea about that part and I had no idea about the software development so there's a, a good team Great story, great story, good teamwork. Um, so let's just um, focus on the, the last few years of uh, that story there, Energy Exemplar. So can you just delve a bit more into that? Tell us about that business. It is a predominantly a software company that models and forecasts the power markets globally, but also models and predicts out to 30 years and helps make investment decisions for business owners in the industry on the wholesale side. We started out in Adelaide, just in a backyard, and 
from there we grew to having global offices around the world in London, North America, South America and South Africa. Wow. All from South Australia, of course, our, our great home. Yes. Started in the backyard. <laughs> so you've exited that business now. Tell us about that. Uh, I sold out to uh, Venture Capital. We went to market. Um, we had quite a lot of interest and I chose to sell out my whole 50% shareholding and exit the company. It's still still running and it's still one of the number one global software, power market simulation software companies in the world. So congratulations, that's a great success story and um, that, that's what this podcast is all about, sharing success stories. I particularly like finding people that have a, a great story to share that are really humble about sharing their story. Uh, so, um, you know, flying under the radar, I like to find some, some gold nuggets and I think you're one of them, Louise. This particular podcast is on the power of collaboration. So collaboration, like I said, I'm passionate about it. Um, when we do it together, we all do better. Um, have you got some examples or some stories within the growth of your business where collaboration was critical to get you to the next, sort of that next tipping point? We had a fair few incidences of collaboration. A lot of our first ones was getting out to the global market which obviously being a small company, there's only so much that you can do. So we had distribution agreements with consulting companies, uh, one in Victoria who did the Asia Pacific, one in Amsterdam that did the European UK region and one in Sacramento, North America that did North American region. So distribution agreements, obviously that's a, um, a way to get your product to market and it is a great example of collaboration. Tell us about some of the challenges that, that, that comes with distribution agreements. One of the big challenges is, is we didn't have control, so we couldn't control the story to the market or the marketing materials, the level of support. They did the first tier support and we would do the second tier support and the bug fixes or any issues with the product. One thing is we, we did set the price and then they could do any markups from there. We found that a consulting business would do it as their second point of business rather than them being their driver, whereas the, the group in Amsterdam, it was their number one point of business. So they were a lot more driven and a lot more successful at the process. And uh, North, North America, uh, there's also a cultural difference. So having people on the ground in their own regions can adapt to the culture and even the language in the marketing material and the way it's presented. So there's a couple of key points there in terms of the cultural differences, the priority that distributors would place on taking your product to market and the control of some of those, the things that you wanted to get some continuity on. Um, so how did you overcome some of those challenges? What, what mechanisms did you put in place to overcome some of those challenges? We bought them out. <laughs> good, good, good strategy. <laughs> we actually worked um, quite closely with the Asia-Pacific distributors. Obviously, that's our region. But also we had to make it very clear to the end users that they couldn't bypass our distributors because that's part of the agreement. So working closely with them relies on a bit of trust? It relies on a lot of trust. Talk to me about trust. It's one of my favourite words. Trust in terms of in a business context. Well, the, you have to trust people to execute to in the best interest of your business and also their business. You actually have to put aside personal issues, even if you have them, because at the end of the day it's a business, which is sometimes people can do it but a good professional person actually can do it. And you've got to rely that that's their business and that's their motivator. So out of um, the energy exemplar part of your life, because there's more f there's more for us to talk about with Louise because she's done so many things, if there was one learning that you'd like to share with the audience about what was the true success of the growth of the business and any practical tips that you've got when it comes to collaboration? I think the more that you stop and listen 
to the people that actually really care about your product. Um, there's a lot of growth in that. We also collaborated a lot with the academic area um, who are very, very passionate about what they do and their industry. And the good thing with them is they're actually not motivated by money. They're motivated by the benefit to the industry and to society. So they were very, very good at doing research and feedback to the development team, which improved the product dramatically. And that was probably the, the big part is you actually have to listen to the end users, but you've also got to be able to filter out the wants versus what's the best thing for the product and the overall product and end users. Quite a few great tips there. And highlighting also another type of partnership with um, academia where they, uh, I'm assuming you just tapped into a lot of research and development and innovation. Uh, we actually offered as part of our business program free software licences to academic students. So they would use it as part of their master's programs or part of their PhD research projects, which would normally, for academics that they don't have money and students, that it was publicly available and we actually didn't restrict them on what version they had. So they had the full commercial version. So all of their reports related very accurately to the, the region and the commercial output of their country, their market. There's great purpose there too. Louise, um, SA Leaders, as you know, is a network of South Australian business owners and, and um, decision makers that are looking to grow their business. Um, I always talk about the fact that the companies in the Leaders Network are like my kids because we're watching them grow up and we, we care and we nurture and we support them. I'm going to share a little story with the audience that one of our member companies uh, had a fast-growing software business in a different industry that you're from, Louise, and I kindly suggested that you could, could mentor another great female business leader. That's collaboration in itself, but would you mind just sharing the story about um, when I introduced you to Noyan, uh, your freight agent, and tell us about that journey. When I... Finally met with Noi from Your Freight Agent, which she reluctantly got in contact with me. She was in distress. She had the world on her shoulders and was virtually to the point of not being able to continue on her business. I sat down, had coffee with her, discussed where the issues might be and then I caught up with her on another occasion and she had withdrawn a contract that I told her not to submit because it was possibly given a big portion of her company away just to be able to win a job. We then reviewed it afterwards, which was the best thing. We changed the way that she approached business from being a freight brokerage company to now, as well as being a freight brokerage company, selling subscription model of the software that she has developed for her in-house, but for her other competitors and other freight brokerage companies to be able to utilise it within their businesses. So the message there is, um, I always talk about business it can be lonely at the top, leading a business wanting to scale with the right support structure around her in this instance. She was able to get some a third party independent view of the business and ultimately change the business model. That's another great example of collaboration. And you said she was reluctant at first. Tell us about the relationship that the two of you built as part of that process. Noi and I have actually become quite close personally, but also through the process of changing the business model, commercialising the software that is produced and also trying to get it through the board and get them across the change of the business model and explaining to them that software technology is, was the way of the future for your freight agent to be able to keep its head above water and continue to be able to be successful. We, we had to do that and had to go through the process and it would be a time-consuming process. It wouldn't be done overnight. Noi felt that she didn't have the support she needed or, or the understanding 
because the people that were supporting her were not from a technology company. They were either from freight industry or uh, board members that actually didn't have the technology knowledge. And technology is not an easy thing and it always takes ten times longer than you'd expect. So after giving her that support, she felt like she wasn't actually going mad and she's so much happier now. She's motivated. She wants to get out there and sell the product. And what does the future hold for that business? The future, she has just signed up Hungary, one of the Hungary clients. Next, she'll be looking at Singapore. So not only is she just doing her freight brokerage from Adelaide, she's now selling subscription licences for the brokerage platform uh, into other regions and other countries throughout the world through referrals. Through referrals? Collaboration? Yes, just if you could delve into that a bit more. She has a people that she had contacted them and got them to sign up to the platform. The, uh, they were small freight companies or brokerage companies that could, once we explained to them the benefit of using the platform, which instead of using one distributor or using logging into multiple platforms to get up, come up with the best quote, her platform did all of them and, com- and combined all of them to come out with the best outcome. So it was much more time efficient. And then they just bought the subscription. They were happy with the subscription and then refer it on to their other partners in different regions. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the growth of that business. Exciting times ahead. It is from, well, the next one is Singapore, the referrals from Singapore. And that is, we haven't even really tapped into the skills of putting Noi out there in the sales front, selling the product. These are ones that are low-hanging fruit from prior. Great story there. Again, all from South Australia. And I think it's very generous of you. You've offered your expertise and, and you ended up investing in that business. Yes, I own nearly 30%. And um, and that is um, it's recognise. I recognise that um, that business has has now got some great scale um, potential to it. It has great scale, but also now that the shareholders can see that there's been progress from nearly having to close the doors and losing money to potentially we will make a profit this year, and then from next year onwards, I think we'll make a decent profit, and so therefore it is an investable company that can bring other people that have got other skill sets on board. Fantastic. It's a technology business. Energy Exemplar was a technology business. What do you see is different about technology businesses versus other traditional businesses? What what, what differences do you see um, in terms of skills, leadership? The Cost. The <laughs> co- cost. Takes four times as long, ten times more. <laughs> um Technology is a, it's, it's quite a it's a fantastic industry, but I think people that come from a different business industry, it's really hard for them to get the concept around it. It's it's slow. Everything takes longer than it should, or as, as anticipated. It's more expensive. The skill set and resources are getting. F- a lot harder to find, especially if you're in a specialised industry like the energy industry. They're they're getting harder and harder to find and a lot more sought after resource and so they become more and more expensive. The same thing for even your freight agent and another technology company I have. To find good developers is also becoming a hard task and it's getting more and more expensive. Wow, there's so much in that. You think technology, you think faster, but actually you're saying technology is actually a slower growth regime. Absolutely, yes, it is. That's why it's hard to explain to people that aren't in the industry, say, you know, I don't know, accountants or someone that, uh, you know, freight logistics or something, but not on the technology side, that they think things will just be pumped out overnight and they're not. And in terms of the skills, you say, the developers um, to, to source, I mean, um, where does collaboration play there? So, um, because I imagine there's some secret source there that um, technology companies are trying to protect, yet you might need to outsource to get the skills that you need, maybe offshore. How do you balance that out? 
That's a good question. Uh, that, that's a very, very hard one. Uh, IP protection is your business if you have a technology business. And when you outsource, people have access to a, a certain portion of your source code, but also you have to make sure that your legal contracts are really ironclad, that you own the IP that is developed and not the contracting company. Yeah. That's a big thing. It's a big thing that a lot of people oversee. They leave themselves open to that. Even uh, websites, people will structure a website, contract it out, and the contractor actually owns the website and doesn't hand over ownership at the end of the contract. So there's uh, some fine grain detail that's required there. There is, yes. You've mentioned contracts a few times in, in this in, in your story when it comes to a few of the different examples that you've given. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. You've got a lot of experience in writing and uh, editing and giving feedback on those contracts. I mean, how? what's your one tip, I guess? Apart from getting a good lawyer and advisor, what's the one... What's the <laughs> that one... is a good tip. <laughs> <laughs> what is your... What's another tip that you could give that is a bit of a more personal insight? With the development of software, make sure that you have a really good licence agreement before you start issuing licences that don't, actually don't. Make sure you also have expiry dates on your or time bomb the, the licences that you issue on a subscription basis. Therefore, if you don't have them sign a contract at the beginning, which you always should, then you can always implement that afterwards. But having a good end-user licence agreement is paramount when you're delivering software. Great tip. Thank you. Just going back to quickly to Energy Exemplar. Energy Exemplar is a very successful technology business in the energy sector, it changed the world in fact in which we were playing in that industry. Um, many people build a technology business with this end goal in sight to exit to a, maybe a, a, someone who acquires them globally, um, the big dream, that there's so many uh, hurdles along the way. What gets you to a point where a technology company becomes really valuable? We said from five years we would be sale ready and we would sell out. It took us 20 years before we sold our company. So the rule of thumb is, I guess, with any business, you should always be sale ready. I think Glenn and I got to a point where we went, OK, there's enough left in the hockey stick for whoever buys us. We had good foundation. We have a good client base. We had good uh, renewals year on year and... There was still a lot of growth just in the energy sector, let alone the other areas that we were also possibly that Plexos could go into, that any investor would still get the benefit from the growth. And I'll just, just uh, note that Plexus is the actual, the software product name, isn't it? Yeah, Plexos for power systems, but also Plexos for gas and Plexos for water. But it was all, it was because it was mathematical software, it could branch out into all other regions, logistics, anything that a mathematical problem could solve. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. And just in summary, just going to go back to the topic of power of collaboration, which is what we're focused on today. Can you just, um, outside of, uh, you know, in terms of what you're doing now, you're doing some interesting things. I know you're doing some property development. Could you just share your view on collaboration in terms of the Australian culture and what last final message you'd like to share with the audience around collaboration? Collaboration helps you get to market or make, helps you achieve your outcomes and goals a lot quicker. I think it benefits more people. The culture tends to be that everybody's got to protect their own little nest and if they help out a competitor or an alliance, then it endangers their own business which is completely untrue. I think collaboration fast tracks most of your processes. It actually brings a lot of intelligence and resources together rather than having to double up on things, reinvent the wheel. People that are, are confident and successful and happy 
will tend to be the ones that will help you out no matter what. They will bend over backwards to help you out and they're the ones that are probably going to be your best resources anyway. I think collaborations a I think it's been underestimated and I think uh, a lot of businesses now are starting to realise that working together and collaborating together is is a far better approach to business and success and, and spreading the success wider and quicker at a probably cheaper way of doing it is, is a better way to progress your business. I think that is a very nice summary. Collaboration comes in all different forms strategically and then it can become, you know, more informally as well. I think also I find now that I'm out of the business and I collaborate more with what they would call start-up businesses or people like your freight agent with Noi. I personally get so much more satisfaction out of helping them and seeing them thrive and flourish and seeing Noi with a smile on her face every time I see her rather than frown lines and wondering how she's going to pay the next bill is it's it's a really personally satisfying place to be in. I agree. It's personally satisfying for me too to see the smiles on both of your faces. <laughs> and I'm truly grateful that you've spent time with us today. I think you should be commended for everything that you've achieved. You know, you're a good friend of mine and I'm proud and I actually want people to know about your story because uh, a smart uh, female South Australian, giving back, generous has built something very successful. Why wouldn't we share that story? Why wouldn't we learn and share for one another? So I'm grateful for your your generous time today. Thank you, thank you for having me. At SA Leaders, we're all about collaboration and community. If you're curious to know more about how we help businesses and leaders just like you to scale and grow beyond their glass ceilings, then visit our website at www.saleaders.com.au. And please don't forget to subscribe, share this podcast with your network and write a review if you really enjoyed it. I'm Natasha Mulani and I look forward to chatting with you next time. Happy connecting. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free. And you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.